trigger on. Welcome, d Roll, to the Dark Face Diaries. We are World Trigger Read-Through Podcast, aiming to discuss the World Trigger manga volume by volume. I'm Wensley Dale Cheddar. And I'm Hoven with an H, and this week we'll be tackling chapters 53 to 61, and for those watching along with the anime, that's the rest of episodes 25 to 28. Uh, so, I, I hazard to say, uh, how have you been lately? It's, it's, it's fine, it's fine, everything is fine. The COVID cases right now are skyrocketing. Uh, I got tested recently because I had a symptom, so fortunately it came out negative. But hey, at least the World Trigger anime is coming back, so how are you doing? Well, I've got something that might cheer you up a tiny bit, at the very least. Because uh, you might recall a few podcasts ago, I said that we'd be really going places if we were fo- someone got us to the Android app. And I don't know how it happened, but we're on the Android podcasting app now, so that's nice. Oh my god, yes, that's true. <laughs> Not only uh, Duckface Diaries is there, Hoven Sideway is there as well. Yeah, I did a spit take when I saw it on there. <laughs> I was like, how? <laughs> uh, it might have just been Anchor doing its thing, but if someone did upload it there, thank you very much, whoever that is. Um... Anchor, let <laughs> us know when you do your thing, jeez. <laughs> uh, apart- yeah, aside from that... I've been playing Hades, the new game from Supergiant, uh, based around the uh, Greek mythology about the son of Hades trying to escape from hell and meet his real birth mother. And uh, it's it's the most Moorish thing on the world, because it just has this gameplay loop of you do a run trying to escape this procedurally generated dungeon, it's all hack and slash, uh, and then like... Uh, whenever you get you die, you get sent back to a hub, hub area, and you have all these conversations with the people there. So you're just like, oh, I want to do the dungeon so I can get some more conversations, and I want to do the conversations so I can get some more dungeon. And you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll just do, like, a room. I can just grind away at a room for five minutes. It won't take much time, and then an entire hour's gone. So, yeah, that's been taking up my life. <laughs> <laughs> I still haven't seen any gameplay of it, and I'm. It's weird since I've always been quite into Greek mythology. Uh, on the other hand, like we we've seen the Blood of Zeus series from the studio behind Castlevania, and that was shit. That was proper proper toss. Uh, <laughs> very bland. <laughs> um, aside from that, I've been editing my World Trigger video, which is progressing slowly but surely. Nice. Uh, yeah. It's funny how the outro music that that Milo Jack Stilitz made uh, was originally going to be uh, in your video, but then... Yeah, it was originally going to be in that first, but then my computer broke down. Uh, so yeah, but I also have some more original music uh, coming for that as well. Nice. So, which, which hasn't been featured on the podcast yet, so that should be good. That's great. Alright, so for today's agenda, we will do a quick recap of Volume 7, created by Daisuke Ashihara, translated this time by Lillian Olsen, but also Sarah Tangney, and uh, Christine Dashiell, three translators, uh, one letterer, as usual, our good old Ace Chrisman, a dad of the fandom, designed by Sam Ellsway, and edited uh, by Hope Donovan and Malene First. Uh, then we will cover our general thoughts uh, with random observations, go to a brief Ashihara comments corner, I think a brief spoiler corner, at least I don't have uh, too much to note, and and then we will move on to our Q&A segment. All right. Does that sound good? That sounds great. I don't know why I ask you, we always do this. <laughs> Now this week I'm just not feeling the Q and A section. Yeah, we got a lot, but I think I'll I think I'll pass on this one. Oh my god, yeah, oh yeah, we got so many questions. Uh, geez, I, I, I dread to think how long this episode is going to be. All right then. Uh, so if you're ready, uh, then let's get to the summary. So. The after commanders get the try on readings of Chica's shot and are very surprised that she's one of the baby birds, giving her massive power. So the leader, High Rain, proclaims her to be a golden goose and a possible candidate for a new god, Ominous, uh, sending two after combatants after her and two others to scatter the border agents. Meanwhile, Osamu, Chika, and Izuho try to defend themselves against the remaining rabbits. But fortunately, Tamakoma 1 comes to the rescue, showing off uh, Composed Beefcake's hand-to-hand combat, Konami's acrobatics and axe trigger, as well as Scruffy Hottie's Eskado shield. 
Uh, we get the information that the cubes holding the captured agents are indestructible, unless you open them properly. So they're pretty confident about rescuing Kitura and breaking open the rabbits, while Osama and Chika get away. But then Enidora, uh, the blackhead one, uh, Rambenine, uh, the commander's brother, Visa, the old one, and Husei, the swishy-haired lad, as as you, you wanted me to say badly, enter the fray. <laughs> We flash back to Replica relaying the info about uh, after ra 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 in the Border Staff meeting. They specifically talk about the horn triggers, how they're implanted from birth to make them more powerful and increase black trigger compatibility. So basically, black horns mean a black trigger, making Enidora, Moira, and uh, Hyrain the highest threat to our knowledge. So Rambenine, the chonky boy, who's Hyrain's brother, appears right in front of the snipers, Taichi and Azuma. Uh, his powerful rapid-fire trigger, Caridon, allows his bullets to pierce even the toughest of shields, so even as Chano, Arafune, and Kakizaki squads come to Azuma's rescue, it looks like the battle's gonna be there for, for the long haul. Meanwhile, in the southwest, uh, Husei attacks Scruffy Hotsi and Kapo's Beefcake with his Iron Sand trigger, and Konami is sent to dispose of the rabbits in one minute. Osama is ordered to protect Chika with his life and is quite happy with the responsibility. As Osami does a job, R Replica explains that Tamakoma's triggers were created with experimental neighbor tech to match the users individually, as opposed to HQs being mass produced. At the same time, Kazama Squad encounters Enidora, the, the explorer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you count the baby birds? Hola. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, we, we already perfect. have one poor accented Lafrequator. We remember, we don't need to. <laughs> uh, I, I, th I think that's perfect. We, uh, we... So they narrowly avoid his sneaky black goo trigger, stabbing them from the ground, thanks to Kikuchihara's enhanced se hearing side effect. We enter a flashback explaining how Kikuchihara got recruited. When his side effect got recognised, it was considered weak and impractical, and he gets bullied for it. Although, to be fair, I suspect it's for his rude personality, mostly. So he goes, Oh, I wish this stupid power had never been recognised as a side effect. It's lame and boring. It won't help you. So, but Kazama scouts him nonetheless, along with his operator, Shiori? Yes, for some reason, it turns out that Usami, uh, Usami has been uh, Kazama's operator, uh, I guess, a few years ago. So, uh, Kazama explains to Kikuchihara, Well, share your audio information via transmission. they will be the ears of the squad. Let's say, hypothetically, other squads rely on your sight for 80% of their perception. We'll have an incredible advantage over them. And you're a full agent, come join my team. <laughs> we need you. <laughs> Perfect. So yeah, th thanks to Kikuchihara, they rise through the rankings as a stealth-themed squad, and it's thanks to him that uh, they're now able to evade Anadora's stabs precisely, even if he tries to distract them with additional noise. When they aggravate him enough, Kazama swoops in and cuts his head off, but it instantly turns into goo and rejoins Anadora's body. At least that's what Kazama thinks. Before, it turns out his opponent has managed to put blades inside his body and finish him off, demonstrating the true power of a black trigger. So, everyone is shocked by Kazama jobbing. Uh, so, Kazama orders Kikuchihara and Utagawa to retreat, citing Sasamori as having more uh, sense when the two still want to fight. We come to Tachikawa assisting Murakami in fighting back against several rabbits, and we see there's a ranking going on regarding who killed most of them, and apparently Asama is counted as having killed one. So Shinoda uh, orders to leave uh, the humanoid neighbours alone and keep protecting the C rank so they don't uh, play into after a -ra -ra scheme. Meanwhile, Jin heads over to meet Arashiyama squad. He asks to borrow Yuma, explaining he's worried for Osama and Chika's fate. The now at future crossroads where anything from the best uh, to the worst future could happen. Because in the worst future, Osamu loses his life. Wow, we got a good turnover transition with this one, didn't we? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, over to you. <laughs> okay. Jin assures Yuma and his alt account that they'll be working to prevent Mikumo's death as a possible future. Uh, he resolves to meet Osamu and uh, and Tamakoma One halfway, with Tamakoma One escorting him and maintaining Kido's guidelines of staying in the emergence area. Tamakoma One are holding off Hughes, but Kamami tries hitting a weak spot in the in his defenses, but is blocked by Visa. 
Uh, on Visa's command, Hughes forms a handheld camera, cannon and fires black shards at Chica, which start pulling her into the air. Uh, Hughes puts up his guard against Scruffy Hottie, but wait, wait, what is this? Oh my god, it's composed beefcake with a steel chair! I mean, I mean, he's fucking, fucking decking him in the face. <laughs> um, in a show of utter badassery, uh, beefcake exposes a weak spot in from Hughes's defences being spread so thin. Uh, and figures out that the shards are magnetic, so decides that he and Konami will stay to hold the neighbours off, uh, sending Scruffy Hottie and Osamu to escort the C-Ranks to HQ. Miwa overhears Shinoda's announcement that Osamu and the others are in need of help, and remembers his promise to Jin, but remains dismissive of it. Of it. Over at some nearby tower blocks, an assortment of agents from various squads, that being Azuma and some of Arafune's squad, are blocking off, are blocked off from helping the C-Rankers by Rambanine, they are joined by Izumi, Midorikawa, and Yone- Yonea, looking to assist. They assess that his major threats seem to be his sheer firepower and incredibly tough, precise shielding. Uh, the battle unfolds in Mikado City University, Izumi surprise attacking him with a combination of Meteor and Viper, before Midorikawa goes in for the offensive with his Grasshopper. He and Yonea attempt to get an attack in, but with no avail. Uh, Rambanine then sends a shot straight through the university building, only barely missing Izumi on the other side. He then flies up into the air. Oopsies, my, my page has gone haywire. Ah! Jump up, don't be scared. <laughs> Jump up and you'll reverse down a stream. <laughs> we could save that one for an outtake. <laughs> ah. <laughs> he then flies up into the air, letting down a rain of bullets and rendering Izume's hiding spot completely useless. Uh, Midorikawa then flees indoors, but is followed inside by Rambanine. However, Midorikawa takes advantage of his overconfidence in a wonderful show of learning his lessons from his defeat at the hands of Yuma, using a smokescreen from a fire hydrant to lower his guard and chop off his leg. Rambo flies out of the building, pulling out all the stops and firing on the others with increased accuracy, but Azuma doesn't seem concerned as he tells the other squads that this actually means that his focus is much more diverted from his precision shields. I'm sorry, did, did you just call him Rambo? Uh, do we have to <laughs> voice Rambo 9 now as Sylvester Stallone? Uh, I, I don't have any quotes written down from him, so no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the gunners and the attackers surround him, gunners open fire, and Izumi lures him into position right below Yonia, who is perked on top of the buildings with one of his special rounds. And Yonia... Uh, Yonea jumps from the building. Uh, but that was not all there was to their plan, for the attackers put their forward their Trion into Yonea's shield, allowing him to block Ramba's, Rambanine's counterattack, and then skewering him in an absolutely awesome two-page spread that was rendered totally ridiculous in the anime adaptation. <laughs> uh, shout out to Screaming. Uh, Ramba seems oddly happy with the result, even laughing at his last-minute surprise attack on Yonea failing and fully acknowledging the border agents as victors. Uh, Moira comes back through the portal, allowing Asuma to make note of her black horns. Join to retreat, Rambanoin! Your job here is done! <laughs> she says, before taking him back into the po- through her portal. Uh, the agents reconvene and decide on where they're going next, with Azumi opting to go and support the C-Rank trainees. We get a nice metaphor of how Din's future site path works, with the agents and the neighbours blo- blowing on a ball that's rolling down various tracks, each side trying to influence which path it ends up on. Uh, it's revealed that Visa is going easy on Konami just as a diversion as a Trion soldier bursts through a house right behind him, continuing on a warpath to HQ. Uh, Scruffy Hotting notices the soldier is he- headed in the direction of his house, and Composed Beefcake, noticing this as well, sends Konami to deal with the Trion soldier. I guess she's kind of the Trion soldier dispatching grump monkey of this <laughs> volume. <laughs> this leaves Beefcake on his own, fending off two humanoid neighbours. Oh noes. Uh, Jin realises the plan at the very last minute, and the volume closes with the reveal that Enadora has infiltrated the base, putting it on high alert. Aw, shit. Oh, no! (laughs) Alright, shall we go to our thoughts? Yep. Let's go. Alright, so this volume was quite enjoyable to read. However, I felt like it wasn't as tightly structured as the previous ones we've read. I mean, it's important. I think it's important yeah. to know that that it's like the build-up stage to a huge arc, but um, it didn't have such a clear beginning, middle, and end as the previous one. Yeah, I think the start of the volume was a bit wheel spinny. Uh, I did like the middle and the end a lot, but it was very clearly just like a compilation of cool bits rather than a, a particularly cohesive structure. It 
Yeah, it's a, it's very much an intermediary volume. You see, for me, it felt like there was one point when where Jin's like, in the worst future, Osama dies, and I thought, ah, oh, it's such a cool note to end the volume on, but nope, there's still four chapters after this. Um, interesting. I will say, in regards to the stakes of the arc, um, I like that one of them being taken out here, it gives us a cool payoff, but it also doesn't take away it doesn't take away from things, since after Krator's after tactic isn't based around simply dominating them in combat, but making sure that their agents are scattered so that they can proceed towards HQ. So you have that ticking clock of them infiltrating the base, and them possibly getting their hands on the sea rankers, uh, so that it doesn't feel like, oh, okay, we can just gang up on them, so we'll get them all eventually. Yeah, it's 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 like the theme of Volume Seven in a nutshell. Um, when uh, composer Beefcake says, uh, like defeating the enemy doesn't count as a victory on itself on home territory. Uh, we have our loved ones, our our personal property to save, and uh, they don't have these stakes. We still have this streak of good end of volume cliffhangers at the very least. Uh, the I'd say the weakest one we've had so far was probably Volume One, and even that was like, hey, you get to see an S rank fight for the first time. So. Mm. Yeah, we've been still been having pretty good luck with that. It, it didn't mean as much earlier, but but yeah, yeah, I suppose. So um, yeah, I, I thought setting up Osama's death. Uh, Sorry, uh, not S rank, A rank. Kitora isn't that good, even though she'd like to think she is. <laughs> <laughs> I am an A rank and you are a C rank. Yeah, th that's right. Uh, I, I thought um, so. I thought setting up Osama's death as a possible scenario uh, added some excellent tension to the arc, especially with uh, especially since World Trigger can do that and uh, like still still have the stakes feel believable with two basically main characters and not being precise about uh, whose adventures are we following exactly. So uh, you could always uh, see either Osama or Yuma as a decoy pro tag yeah. and. Yeah, J um, Jin Jin's side effect r really helped in um, in in creating that tension. Mm, yeah, I really love the contrasting personalities of the neighbors. It strikes that nice chord of mixing pure heels with people who just want to get the job done, and then the more amiable opponents. I'm always a fan of the the antagonistic team being kind of a jumble of personalities. I thought the theme of individualism versus collectivism is strong in this one. Um, especially like in uh, Ramba 9's fight. Hmm. There's not really much to discuss about it apart from the fact that it's like reversed to like what I traditionally expect from, from shonen action manga. It's, it's a whole team of underdogs teaming up to defeat one powerful antagonist. All of the contributions hmm. matter as well, at, at the very least in discovering what Ramba 9's trigger does, uh, uh, Azuma's command, uh, the shields at the end especially, and and of course, let us not forget Karuma's superior acting skills. <laughs> he literally didn't have to act at all. The, this lad <gasps> belongs on Broadway, and and uh, you can't you can't convince me otherwise. Uh, he he's a superior actor. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, the Ramba Nine fight. It's it's so much more than just winning through ganging up. It's a great way of them both weathering him down behavior wise. And also playing into how effective a good bluff can be, and making use of how he gets used to patterns from them and constantly underestimating them. Which is both there in a micro way with Midori Kawa, what he learned, and also can be applied to the battle on the whole with how he has grown to expect them sort of double bluffing him. And so the fact that they have another curveball with Yonia at the end gets him on get completely is what seals the deal. I really liked Midorikawa like uh, flashing back to uh, quoting Yuma in uh, in the line people who assume they'll win are full of openings. It it really it's really nice to see uh, him learning from his mistakes. I mm. I don't remember enjoying uh, enjoying his character arc in that as much as I, uh, I did now. So, mm. uh, yeah, good stuff. Um, also, yeah, the, the three A rank idiots are such a good trio. Easy <laughs> uh, going. Oh, we'll be fine. I have two bullet magnets with me. <laughs> uh, utter dickhead. <laughs> The Kazuma squad versus Enadora fight is also pretty cool. Uh, Kazuma makes a great character to job, considering that we just had the matches between him and Osamu right before the arc. Uh, and Kikuchihara's side effect is utilised really well. It's quite a subtle one, uh, 
Uh, so, but it's they've clearly Ashihara has clearly thought quite hard about how it would be a big edge in certain situations. Yeah, I I really enjoyed his flashback, um, even though I I don't really want to get into that here, so, since I've already t- talked about it in the introductory episode. But uh, it was really good stuff, and it he's still a rude dickhead, so, so it um doesn't make me warm up to him or, or anything. It does like explain his his action, his kind of personality a bit more. I'll say this: he's like. He's a rude character, and I don't like him as a person, but his rudeness isn't something that, like, bothers me, because I'm like, okay, he works fine as that kind of snarky, uh, detached character in the story. Oh yeah, totally. I, I would very much <laughs> hate him in real life, uh, but uh, he makes for a really entertaining character, and, and it's not like he's he's especially lionized or anything. He's just a rude dickhead, and that's it. I like when Composed Beefcake has that moment with Chica when he reminds her of the basic rules of sniping and how how she uh, uh, forgot it in battle. It, it's uh, they do understand the tenet of the best shenpai kohai relationship. <laughs> shenpai kohai, yeah, he 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 is a very good sort of big uncle, big brother figure of the squad. That scene and also him realizing that Ka- that Scruffy Hottie's uh, house was about to be crushed and being like, "Yo, Konami." Could you deal with that? <laughs> uh, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's very caring. Uh, I so I I've been listening through some earlier episodes of the, of this podcast, just you know, to refresh myself on what my thoughts were, and it's become a. I've noticed it's become a bit of a trend that a lot of my random observations are. Oh, I forgot this thing, <laughs> and uh, a latter volume clarifying a question I had with a prior one. So we're going to have a little mini segment, which we don't have to put in music for, called Hovin Forgot. <laughs> Too late. I, um, I, I've already put the <laughs> Benny Hill theme. I, I don't know. <laughs> Just put Benny Hill in the background of it. The whole way through. Uh, so we have the first excuse of a skewed over from Scratty Scruffy Hottie and Grasshopper from Midori Kawa. Yeah, no, in my head, they just kind of appeared out of nowhere in the next arc. Uh, so I didn't remember that they happened here. Uh, also, this this volume confirms that, yes, rads do open gates. Wensleydale was right. Yay. And last of all, oh, so that's what Wensleydale meant by Osami being a f- f- reformed conserver squad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't remember that? Oh. No. That's like a very important part of a character. So, so, so yeah, the, the manga confirmed. She, she used to be on uh, 4chan a lot. Be- speaking of which, seems... Gawa also has the hots for Usami, so it, it looks like you've got yourself another rival in love, in addition to Kodera. Yes, a lot of competition. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, one other. Uh, even Kikuchihara is surprised that Kazuma is 19. As far as like the map highlights at the beginning go, I really liked Ammo wiping down Trion soldiers, along with the city, and <laughs> Tachikawa wants to mow down new model, and then it's like taking Suwa in cube form. Uh, yeah, Ashara really likes to hit home the fact that uh, Sua's a cube, guys. Tachikawa is just big, no thoughts, head empty. This volume, just like I need to go, I need to go mow down some more. I can't lose the competition. <laughs> I like his like his little interaction with Murakami. Uh, so I I do have a standout panel. Um, it, it's not really a comedic mm-hmm. one this time. It's it's not really not really that much a, of an um, action panel. Mm-hmm. I, I really like seeing the old university from above. Uh, like like the battleground for the uh, fight with Rampo Nine. Yeah, Ashihara is really good at like the space visually. Uh, so we under- understand where the battle is going on, mm. and uh, also the the little panel showing the positioning of Izumi's tra- trajectory and Rampanai's intended attack that missed is Izumi. I thought that was really nice. Yeah, I'm going to make this a bit of a compliment sandwich of standout panels because I have a, a panel I don't like. It's my resident volume nitpick. Uh, I find the split screen page of the humanoid neighbors arriving. It looked a bit stiff and awkward. It's like. Having all the panels be really, really similar can work well if everyone is doing a distinctive pose, but they all look very similar, and all of the poses also look very similar, so it it just looks a bit stiff to me. Yeah, and then I think my standout panel, my other standout panel, uh, in a good way, is Visa just standing there while a Trion soldier crashes through the house behind him. It it was really nicely laid out, um, and it it played into kind of the surprise of the moment as well. As, so it's it's interesting that this volume had three translators, and it it kind of shows. I haven't noted 
down uh, much in particular, but, but uh, there are some choices I spotted that, that are a bit inconsistent with characters who usually talk to each other. I really think Utagawa saying Miss Usami uh, when referring to Shiori uh, uh, stood out in, in a really awkward way. What are you, a 19th century footman? I, I, I know it's a convention, but to translate son to it, but uh, at the same time, it always uh, sounded weird to me when not in an archaic context. Lady Usami, you're late for your corset shopping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay, per perfect, right, uh, yeah, uh, Utaga Utagawa has th that personality now, okay, uh, we got an uh, the character, we all we're on a roll with these. Uh, yeah, I think composed beefcake just fucking decking the rabbits and hues, uh, was so cool, uh, I think he'd fit in very well in the manga Golden Kamui, which has a lot of composed beefcakes, um, doing cool physical feats. I'm also just realizing that the anime changed it so the, the trigger activation is not narrated. It's it's not a big note, but but it's interesting, I guess. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Wait. Which trigger activation? Uh. The, uh the, like the like the Sailor Moon transformation sequence. Oh yes, they they uh, always uh, add those. Trigger on. Um. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and with uh, uh, in the anime, it's like not not narrated, like exchanging try and uh, it's exchanging physical body for trying body, blah blah blah. Ah, oh, right. Uh, and in, in the in the manga, it's there uh, at least in uh, okay. Konami's activation. Ah, okay. Uh, Konami having a different hairstyle in her Trion body feels like a first. Uh, I wonder how far the aesthetic tweaks can go with that sort of thing. I mean, it must have been it must have been there in the uh, when she trained with Yuma. Yeah, no, I think this is just the first time I properly saw it, I get I properly noticed it, I guess. Uh okay. I like that the neighbors are also very surprised by uh, some weapons that Border has in the arsenal, like Enadora mm. uh, being surprised by the chame chameleon trigger and how um Kazama Squad escaped him. Afto's use of of the horns to increase black trigger compatibility is an interesting feature. I wonder if Husei got his hand on on one of Border's triggers, uh, one of Border's bra black triggers. It would be um, maybe he could use it. Yes, just it would give them more flexibility with their use of that. Um, like especially with Fujin, um, that was generally quite conducive, yeah, to other agents. <laughs> yeah, just like Tachikawa, just like I finally get to use the Fujin, yay! <laughs> Uh, oh. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking please of which, give me those horns. <laughs> speaking of which, can someone please draw fan out of Tachikawa wielding Senku Ishigami as a sword <laughs> <laughs> from Doctor Stone? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I've got one more note, but but it's uh, more of a general one. I've got to mention it. Mm -hmm. uh, so yep. uh, speaking of themes, the, this volume also sets up the theme of fate and to what degree it's like inevitable and, and to what extent uh, we have control over it. I expect we'll have mm -hmm. um, more to say about it next volume when Scruffy Hottie and Post Beefcake's character arcs resolve. I really like the panel layout of Konami using the Sagetsu. Kar Karasawa being out of town is a nice touch to emphasize how Border has been slightly caught off guard by this. Like, they probably won. Did he play rugby in college, though? <laughs> Uh, I kept calling Rambanine High Rain in my notes until I until I uh, corrected it. So it's another it's another one of those. <laughs> Same. The, the designs are so similar. Jeez. <laughs> perhaps perhaps Ashihara was suddenly aware of how similar the designs look in black and white and decided to remove him from combat earlier <laughs> than the rest because of that. Um, his trigger design is is very distinctive with his cloak morphing into like a machine like boxish form. Uh, almost like the outline of a missile launcher. It it walks the line between being very alien and very familiar quite well. Yeah, for me, it looked like angel um, wings, to a certain extent. Okay. I guess, yeah, the boxy nature and the fact that he kind of essentially launches missiles out of it is why that was conjured to mind for me. Yeah, but he also flies with it, so yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think that's all of my random observations. All right, uh, shall we get to Ashihara com Comments Corner? Let's do it. Uh, we haven't got uh, a lot of extra materials this volume, but I did want to talk a little bit about Chano's character profile. Mm. Yeah, last episode I mentioned that I vaguely remembered Chano being a trans bloke, and I think I said it was from the data border briefing file. Mm. Uh, well, it's not. It, um, at the time, I believe I gathered the information from the World Trigger wiki, which in turn took it off this character profile uh, that we got this volume. 
Uh, so yeah, Ashihara says, also I looked at my character data chart and it said Makoto Chano, a tomboy. I realized that I could get into trouble and pretended not to have seen it. So yeah, honestly, it, it does strike me as a huge missed opportunity for trans representation. It would be awesome for a trans mask people in, in the fandom to feel like they can be seen um, in the form of a mi minor character uh, who's not drawn in that different of a way to, to the other male characters. And yet, to have his expression questioned by the meta might feel unfortunate at best and invalidating at worst. Possible identity reduced to just a tomboy. It's especially egregious uh, given that uh, like you, you have a trans mask individual in the localization team trying to bring World Trigger over to the West in the best quality possible. Th that said, I, I do think Ashihara's response is as diplomatic as possible. Uh, it's... Uh, it gives me the vibe of I don't know about I don't know a lot about this subject, so I left it alone. But uh, yeah, judging from Chano's wiki entry, it's it's produced a phantom response that got pretty ugly, calling him the best female character. To oh, she's like Jericho, she must be dressing as a man to make herself feel stronger, as if it like made sense in uh, in a futuristic series where muscle mass doesn't doesn't influence Trion values or like anything how they fight. It's unfortunate. Uh, I I don't have much to import besides the wording of it was strange, and at first I interpreted it as Ashihara worrying that it was in inappropriate to thirst over tomboys or something. Uh, I didn't really think of it from that angle. I d talked a little bit about it with Ace Chrisman, uh, the letterer for World Trigger, and uh, this is what he said basically. Chano stuff uh, was something. Uh, I really want Chano to be trans, I think that would be really cool. And um, maybe this is an unpopular opinion, but I'd like it if uh, they didn't really mention it otherwise. Have everyone just accept it because it's not a big deal to other characters. Uh, I think this would be cool. Uh, find out uh, about his sex through background info like this, but uh, have it never brought up in the series itself. Although, uh, yeah, he wanted also that trans pride on full display. So, yeah, in my heart, he'll always be trans, no matter how things shake out. It wouldn't probably uh, hit for me as hard if I didn't see the, the phantom response to it, but, but at the same time, I kind of see how this issue is handled by by Oda and with the Yamato debacle and uh, what phantom response it produces. So yeah, I I do really wish that that uh, authors ha had the time to research the matter and uh, and maybe n not be as wishy washy about it. Mm. Yeah, I mean obviously. They, that is that is thinking in very good faith, and in some cases it might just be that they don't want they want to they want to remain ignorant. But like I'm just thinking, one author who I'd say overall improves with their trans uh, or non-binary representation is uh, what well, I don't remember his first name, Togashi uh, Yas Yasuhiro Togashi, I think uh, I think Togashi of Hunter Hunter and. Uh, Yu Yu Hakusho fame, and it is notable that Togashi is like the only author in Jump who has literally full reign to make his manga at whatever ledger that he has, so he probably has that spare time to look into these things. Well, I mean, the health is both really poor, so uh, I feel like there's some common ground there. Yeah. And I will also say, yeah, another MathWiz vid to check out. It's the second episode in a row I'm recommending her stuff. Uh, she, all, she does a video on Togashi's trans representation, which is very worth a look. Nice. Uh, I, I have a few other comments on the comments corner, unrelated. Mm -hmm. uh, Go on. So, uh, Enadora, the number one adorable Moe character, <laughs> along with the Rads and Kinuta. Uh, not much to say there, except someone edit them into the Lucky Star or Kaon opening <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be something. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I do have one more note. Um, yep. so, so, Kuruma is a, tra a class traitor. Apparently he's like from the, uh, let me put up his profile, he's like a fawn who's strayed from his herd, a target for everyone, he comes from a rich family and grew up super spoiled, but he's a well-balanced person who's humble uh, uh, and he's uh, never been angry in his life. So, so that, uh, that, probably explains, uh, that probably explains why uh, Taichi and Murakami are so, so loyal to him. His hair will soon become hurly like the Buddha. <laughs> uh, Taichi's Fish Tank Chronicles sound like an amazing filler flashback in the making. Toei, what the hell are you doing? Get on it. <laughs> 
I'm also a bit angry that <laughs> Kuruma's profile doesn't mention his superior acting skills. <laughs> what the hell, Ashihara? Uh, and, uh, my, my last comment is that the chapter 57 colour page, Q's and V's positions were reversed until I realised they made a choo-choo train composition. <laughs> what did he mean by this? <laughs> uh, how? Is it the way that, like, the circles... Are arranged. I'm very confused. If you made them change places, I, I guess um, I guess you would have like two rows uh, looking in opposite directions. It's so, like they're making two trains. Ah, oh, right. Well, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Uh, also, background outlines on top of capes. Uh, tools expand creativity. That wasn't a thing on, until uh, he made it in digital. Yeah, the digital format definitely fits with his art style quite well. I have to wonder if like things like the grasshoppers weren't influenced by that because they have that very like precise square sort of negative space aspect to them okay shall we move on to spoiler corner yeah uh yeah that's it for me so let's transition into spoiler corner ha ah, transition b b because chano mm. uh <laughs> all right so yeah, uh, spoiler corner. So we see time and time again how characters in World Trigger are influenced by uh, each other's strategy. So it's really interesting how Husei took uh, Viper off Scruffy Hottie when he got caught off guard with it. As well as Eskado, both from him and Jin when he got defeated with it, basically. Mm. Also, yeah, it's just very fitting that Hughes is one of the first after humanoids that Asami meets. Yeah, that's true. Mm. I'd also say, so, High Rain's acquire a new god comment uh, in reference to Chico is the first mention of a god trigger, as far as I can recall. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, it, that doesn't get explained until very recently, if I recall correctly. Uh, we got a question about it, but it's really interesting how early he established himself, given that we see uh, Yuri Rinto and... Uh and Michael Crone in this volume. Yeah. Um, Tamakoma triggers for Osamu and Chika once they go on the away mission? Question mark? Uh, it would be like, uh, I guess it would be a nice boon to have uh, since the Tamakoma triggers are very distinct uh, and, uh, and like would give them a, a new little gimmick for their fights. Uh, and it would also give them a, personali a personalised trigger along with humour. Yeah, I, I, I specifically wonder if like, during the um, away mission, Osamu and Chika uh, would get a chance to add their own neighbor trigger to the arsenal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Husei and Yuma already have one, so uh, yeah. only seems appropriate. Mm. Uh, Yuma teaching Midori Karma, teaching Yuma! It's like poetry, it rhymes, because Yuma then gets the, uh, the grasshopper idea from Midori Karma. Yeah! Oh yeah, that, that's true. Uh, so I originally thought that uh, Murakami's build-up as the number four attacker was kind of understated, but mm. uh, wow, H him taking on three rabbits at once, uh, mm. when, uh, when like, uh, yeah, Kazama Squad uh, w wasn't exactly struggling with one, but but, uh, but a attacked uh, one with the three of them. And uh, Murakami attacking three, it's uh, and just calling it. Oh yeah, it's pretty exhausting. It kind of means more than I thought. Yeah. Also, just Tachikawa being a good sport and being like, yeah, give some of my victories to him. He he did most of the work. Is is nice. Uh, that's all my spoiler notes. All mine too. All right. Perfect timing. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's transition into the Q and A. Let's do it. Oh, okay. I thought not much time has passed, but but apparently it did. Okay. Oh dear, I, I feel I, I feel for the editing editing process for you. <laughs> the first one comes from uh, from Reddit from <laughs> Randall fifty five. So uh, let's see how far ahead did Ashihara have everything planned? Uh, yeah, that's what we talked about in the spoiler corner. So ch chapter 54, um, page 2, has Yotaro in the after meeting knowing about neighbors with horns, and uh, chapter 55, page 11, has uh, two other Tamakoma characters being revealed. So, yeah, Yotaro being in there is neat, because it can be interpreted two ways. It's both like, oh, he's, in, he's one of the director's sons. He's one of like the, you know, the, the, the board of director's sons, so he gets to be in there. But then he, we know now, it's like, you know, he's very involved, with, he's a very important political figure <laughs> in the World Trigger universe. So, uh, and, yeah, uh, yeah Ashihara d does strike me as, as like, the same kind of Oda type that, that, that plans a lot ahead, mm. if not, yes. yeah, in, entire arcs. Yes. 
I mean, I think all mangaka are to some degree part gardener, part architect with how they plan things out, but yeah, he definitely seems to like the type to plan ahead things very thoroughly. I haven't heard that metaphor yet. Really? I, I use it so much, how have you not? <laughs> um, the, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, it's, origi I think it's George R.R. R. Martin who originally, that was the original quote. Oh, um, I see. And yeah, the, the story just feels very premeditated, and there are lots of narrative payoffs that are just fit into place too well and too neatly not to have been considered a decent way in advance. Uh, so the next question is, the next question is, who would be the hardest after neighbor for a one-on-one-v-1? Rambanine was a serious problem. Yeah, I think, I, I think I'd go with Enadora. He, he, he's, yeah, just very, very slippery. <laughs> <laughs> very slippery, very gooey. Uh, yeah, I um and and, and Mexican apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Anadora the Explorer. Anadora's like trigger is very hard to get around. Uh, I, I feel I feel like if it were not for Kikuchihara Squad, it, it, it's Kikuchihara Squad. Uh, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> I'm I'm fed up of Kazama grilling me with facts and logic every day. I'm gonna take over. Oh, I, oh, I can't be bothered with <laughs> Kazama. <laughs> I feel like uh, Grail best said, uh, I, I'd still say uh, Enidoro would be the worst due to his weakness re requiring so much work to spot and otherwise being invincible. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, as we'll get to in the next volume, it, it's, whew, it's quite hard to beat. Yeah, and uh, the third question is, favourite volume cover? Um, mine is this one. Uh, yeah, aesthetically, I find 15 and 16 are very cool, like, but... 22 has big sentimental value for me, especially because I called in advance that Chica would be the perfect character to feature there, and it's it's such a pivotal moment for her. Uh, what are 15 and 16? 15 is Tachikawa, uh, and 16 is the one of Hughes and Yotaro. Oh, I see. Um, my favourite is probably volume uh, 22, uh, just with Chica reading her the asteroid shot uh, from above. It's... Uh... I mean, it hits well emotionally, and also it's an interesting pose. In general, girls in these volume covers have more dynamic poses than the guys mostly, since... Yeah, they're often put upside down in cool ways. Uh, and the guys just stand there. It's, <laughs> it's just nothing special, really. Then aren't we going to move over to Twitter, where Bantu King has a few questions. Have you read the transcripts of the Border Breathing Files? I think you can take this one, because I have not yet. Uh, yes, so... I mostly read them. I wish if it were officially translated, so so I could buy it. But I'm I'm happy with what I have. It's really an uh, an illuminating uh, data book, and I I think uh, one of these days we we might devote an ep episode or several to it because yeah. it's it's very dense. Uh, we could go into like A ranks and B ranks and uh, the border stuff separately. I think it's a good thing to put on the back burner until we go with the monthly episodes and we're looking for more content to cover to, so that we're not just doing like, eh, let's just talk about the new chapter for 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, eventually uh, we'll we'll start getting to, to like the monthly chapters and, and covering them. Yes. And there will also be, there could well be more months where Ashihara needs to take one off. So we'll have stuff to do. Yeah, that, that's true. And and like, if not, if, if it turn, turns out that this is too dense of a material, we could also do it li like as a Patreon exclusive. Yeah. Also works like like what we've planned with the uh, with the filler arc podcast. Hmm. Okay. Do, 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 do. So uh, the next question from Banter King is, um, what's your favorite borders trigger? And what's your favorite neighbor's trigger? Uh, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. So yeah, my favorite border trigger is Grasshopper followed by Escudo. I, I think I gave the reasons why in the introductory episode. I really like how they make use of space and uh, I'll go into this more on my video actually. But yeah, I, that's one of the big things that World Trigger does like no other series for me in its combat. And my favorite neighbor trigger, it's very simple. It's the Doctor Octopus Man from Galapola. <laughs> it's because he's Doctor Octopus. I, I, yeah, yeah, that, that's a good reason. Yeah. Okay. Um, my favorite border <laughs> trigger uh, would be the spider. It becomes one of my favorite characters' main weapon, and uh, utilizing his uh, like tactical ingenuity um, to a great extent. Um, um, I, I love what it does in the arc, and uh, I would like to have it as well. And it, it also gives some other characters more mobility, so, so that's great. Uh, and also, my favorite neighbor trigger is um, is Lampyrus. I, I believe that's how Hugh says trigger is called 
it's like um, mm-hmm. the uh, ultimate uh, ultimate attack and defense in one. Uh, I, I really like its shielding capabilities. It, it's multi-purpose. It, it can capture uh, some people. So yeah, that's great. Uh, so we get a uh, from the World Trigger s- server from Old Samu received your energy. Asks <laughs> says put three teams in a forest stage. Play out what will happen and tell us who which team wins. This is not a question, but it'd be entertaining to do. Uh, so, how thorough is yours? I've got a little mini fanfic written out here. Oh, oh wow. Okay, yeah, m- uh, mine is not very detailed. Uh, um, I-, I just really, um, I just really like to see three A rank teams uh, battle together. Uh, specific- specifically, we haven't seen Conserva Squad fight with each other, so, so I would like Tachikawa Miwa Squad and Kazama Squad to. Uh, to uh, be in a forest stage. Uh, I suppose Miwa Squad wouldn't pick this stage, so it wouldn't be a rank war uh, in particular, uh, since, yeah, they have two snipers and forest is a no-no. I suppose that Kazama Squad would win in that one, mm. because uh, they have an advantage in, in, like, being cloaked in nature in addition to the invisibility. I suppose in, um, to a certain extent, I believe at, at the start, Miwa and Kazama Squad would team up because they would think that... Uh, because Miwa would think that Tachikawa is um, is more of a th- threat here. So yeah. So, uh, I have also picked Kazama Squad, and I have picked alongside with them, Yuba Squad and Kakizaki Squad. Okay. Uh, so, let me set the scene. A few skirmishes knock down the team numbers until it becomes a stalemate. Uh, Kazama tries to debate, debate a bear, programmed in as a nature hazard, uh, on facts and logic, and gets eaten. <laughs> uh, Kikuchi Hara... As the sole remaining member of the squad gives up and bails out. Uh, Yuba is initially overwhelmed as the dense foliage addles his urban Yakuza based sensibilities, but Yukari <laughs> brings him to his senses with, with grit, reliability, and determination, and he goes full tropical commando, fashioning his jacket into a cool vest and, uh, and everything. Uh, unfortunately, despite everything, Kakizaki and his plucky teammates manage to pick Yukari off totally throwing off Yuba's groove and shortly luring him into a trap where they dispatch him. Wow, I, I, I can't wait for Yuba going commando. <laughs> Th- this should be the episode title if we were doing episode titles. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Next one. Uh, do, 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 do. So from the WMR server, so um, Arcus Rhapsody asks, is there a fight between any characters or teams you would like to see? So uh, we uh, touched upon it multiple times, but uh, do you have any more candidates? Uh, Ikoma and Miwa. I'm going to put Ikoma against any of the more heel-type characters because I think it's funny. <laughs> uh, then Arafune Squad and Nasu Squad. You have one mostly ranged versus an entirely ranged spl- squad. So Kuma- Kumagai's placement could be really key. Uh, and also Moira and disgruntled Irish listeners everywhere, if you're out there. I would like to see, again, Tachikawa Squad to go against uh, Tamakoma 1. It'd be interesting to see how uh, like the the two top-tier teams in, in Border could go against each other, and if uh, Yuigo would be enough of a liability to for Tamakoma Squad to win. Yeah, the next question, uh, also from Arcus Rhapsody. What do you consider the most inventive use of a Trion body in the series? My answer for this, very much preempts it's another one that preempts a comment i'll be making in a couple of months from now when we get to the volume but oh samus and me was at the end of the invasion arc uh definitely for me yeah i, I totally get that uh i i would say i i have a much less dramatic one i, I think yuma sealing his wounds w- with a scorpion in in one of the rank war battles it, it, it's a uh, uh, I, th- I thought it was a really inventive use of it and uh, com- combining that them that way. Yeah, they, they use a lot of creative ways to handle them because they are basically walking meat shields. Um, so you get a lot of cool uses of them. Uh, base Forever asks, Wasura Naida, we base, base forever. forever. Uh, do you wish the series had stuck more with fighting giant monsters and not pivoted towards the team versus team combat that dominated most of its run? Uh, we've answered this question once already, I think, but... Have we? Um, no, no, we answered a question that was similar, which was, do, would you like it, would you have liked it if it had stuck to... Uh, Osami teaching Yuma about Japan. This is a bit different. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess my answer would be mostly no. Uh, Ashihara is very good at writing intricate, engaging team battles, but a little more variation could have been nice. 
uh, even with Gallipola, which broke up the formula of the Rank Wars eh, a little. It, the Treon soldiers felt very incidental and much less smartly used than the Afterkrator invasion. I would agree with that. I like the more interesting tactics in the uh, in the back and forth, but but um, it would also be nice to see more of a variety. Uh, so the next one's from the WMR server. It starts off with G Flugel. How would you evaluate the potential of Treon-based technology on the adult industry? Uh, so okay, how PG are I've I've written an answer, but I have to ask how PG do we want this podcast to be? <laughs> uh, I, um, uh, yeah, I I. I I think we're marked as not safe for work, but but uh, but then again, uh, we've mostly done minus words so far. So hmm, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, try it out. Try it out, and I'll, uh, I'll bleep you where, wherever I feel it's appropriate. Uh, something something pain sensor. If you're into that, something something wires. Something something ability to cosmetically change your tree on body. <laughs> That's what I got. Well, uh, they do They do the last one, certainly. Katori upping her breast size. Anywho, D Arc Supernova says, um, if you assign uh, people in the WMR server into teams, uh, what would they be and which triggers would they use? Okay. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is reaching a certain level of inside jokey, but also I think the WMR server make up quite a lot of our listener base, so we should probably, probably entertain this. Uh... <laughs> yes, so uh, apologies to uh, everyone else. Uh, this is probably the last yeah. question, so, so yeah, uh, you can skip to the outro. <laughs> yeah. I, I only recognise a handful of people, so I don't know about teams, but I'm sure Brawla can fashion some sort of weapon out of her spicy fanfiction. <laughs> Base Forever has eternal bass-boosted sound attacks. Corito Prime, being a prime, has the Allspark from Transformers, which basically functions as a huge asteroid-type trigger, there are too many people on the WMR server, so I'm basically just going to say who I see in what position. Uh, Nick strikes me as a gunner using uh, two pistols uh, with probably Viper and Asteroid. Chris strikes me as as like an attacker who uh, just uses Grasshopper and, and Teleport. Brawler I would see as an attacker, Carito probably as a shooter. Arcus I think would be a sniper, uh, would definitely not get along with me but be because they keep suspecting me to be the imposter in our weekly Among Us games, Base Forever and Giflugal, they will be snipers too. Yeah, we also got some more questions from Diarc Supernova uh, on the subject. So, who here would you pick from your team? Gonna cheat and say Wensleydale. Who would you trust to help in a fight and duck face on a regular basis? <laughs> Second verse, same as the first. We kind of already have a team, Team Odar. So I guess I'd pick you as the all-rounder, myself as the shooter slash trapper, Dr. Nova as the Kogetsu base attacker, Grail9 as a as an Ibis base sniper with a stupid sniper hat, and then uh, I draw Shitty Art as our plucky operator who's like, I don't know what I am doing, uh, and Caster UK as our engineer who never makes it to our matches because he's like, Oh, I have D&D, sorry. Ah, wow, we've got a lot of snipers in this server. <laughs> It's, is this is this our Afune squad? Uh, uh, and then then his last quite the the uh, their last question is how is there no duck face emoji on this server? I've got the answer for you there, pal. Enadora has hacked the systems. He's been a secret moderator all along. Uh, I do believe they have a replica bot though. <laughs> all right then. Uh, I think that's the last question. Uh, finally, I I dread to see. Oh my god, we went over an hour. Uh, okay. Y yeah. Let let's round off. Yeah. So, that is going to do it for the seventh episode of Duckface Diaries. You can listen to us on so many podcast hosting sites, including anchor.fm slash Cheddar, youtube.com slash c slash Cheddar, Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, Google Podcasts, Breaker, Radio Public, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Play FM, Podbean, Castro, <laughs> Listen Notes, and the Android Podcast app. Anchor.fm slash Wednesday Cheddar uh, or YouTube.com slash C slash Wednesday Cheddar is where all the links are. Remember that much like the neighborhood, the YouTube algorithm is the dark abyss of sorrows and woes from which videos like these never surface. And what helps us navigate it is liking, subscribing, and sharing the podcast with a friend. There you get access to not only Duckface Diaries, but Manga Mosaic, a collection of podcasts and video essays on Jumpstart Manga and more. Recently, I've put out a podcast about children's car games, so check out the podcast on Destroy All Humankind that they can't regenerate. Plug our sister show. Uh, yes, that's uh, Hoven's Hideaway. Uh, it's uh, You can find it on Hoven with an H, uh, on anchor.fm slash Hoven's Hideaway, I think, uh, and all the basically all the same podcasting apps as before. Uh, 
I'd say we haven't recently done an episode at all. Um, what was the last one we did? Oh yeah, it was the under. Oh, fuck! How do I forget this? Yeah, we recorded an Undertale cast with Zeno, uh, a friend of mine from uni, and uh, yeah, we get a lot of good discussions. It's Undertale and Deltarune, so check that out, or you're gonna have a bad time. I stammered a lot. Yeah, it took a while to edit. <laughs> if you'd like to help me upload Duckface Diaries on a le- regular basis, consider supporting me on patreon.com slash Cheddar. In return for your support, you get access to rewards such as at the $1 tier, a shout out in your name of the credits, uh, at the $3 tier, requesting a short series to be covered on the Monkey Bowers Egg podcast, at the $6 tier, a World Trigger Duckface avatar, at the $12 tier, access to the show notes, and at the $25 tier, requesting to be a series to be covered on a long-form video essay. Higher level contributors get access to manga threads for series from the Shonen Jump Vault I'm reading for the very first time, including my first impressions on the chapters and standout panels. Help me reach goals such as reviving World Trigger Abridged or more manga video essays. Now patrons can vote on the subject of the video essay every time we hit a milestone. Send us emails, questions, comments, suggestions at wensleydale 12 at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at Duckface Iris or individual Twitters at Wensley Cheddar and at Hoven with an H. A sincere thank you to Milo Jack Stillis who composed our ending theme and an orchestral rendition of Girigiri, the first opening sequence for World Trigger. You can find his work at soundcloud.com slash milojackstillitz. Okay, uh, next time we will be covering Volume 8, which covers chapters 62 to 70, as well as the rest of episodes 28 to 31 if you're watching along with the anime. And guess what? This one actually ends nice and neatly with the volume. Woo! Amazing. This was the seventh episode of Duckface Diaries, and as always, it's time to bugger off. And for my Polish friends, Yebach Peace! peace.